Hi, thanks for joining us for the Social Media Week session where today we're discussing IP in social media. I'm Dougal Perman from Inner Ear. I've been very involved in Social Media Week and Tim Wright, um, one of the organisers of Social Media Week, asked Murray and I to uh, have this conversation. I'm joined here with Murray uh, by Murray Buchanan, um, Hello. former uh, lawyer for record labels such as Warner and Virgin. That's right, um, yeah. And then IP lawyer and um, now creative entrepreneur who's also studying design communication. Communication okay? design. Communication design, yeah. That's okay. Um, and you're something of an expert in IP issues legally but also in the, the deployment of them and um, sort of exploitation of IP rights, yeah. particularly online, would you say? Yeah. Or is that that's become increasingly more, because I guess when you started um, learning about and working with rights management, it would have been a different landscape to today in terms of how people interact with intellectual property. Very much so. I was in the, I suppose, fortunate position of being, uh, working as a lawyer within uh, Virgin Group, when the internet as a consumer proposition first arrived, and uh, we, uh, as a company, were approached by many uh, startup businesses who, at that time, were keen to uh, license our content, which was mainly recorded music, for their uh, distribution platforms, and some of them were also looking for investment from from Virgin. Uh, so I, I, I had the the, uh, the job of essentially assessing these for Virgin Group, which was a fantastically interesting experience at the time. So I've been thinking about this since in about 1998, 97, something like that. Music is uh, a great example, but seems almost, um, it's quite an old example of um, how rights got uh, turned on their the head really, yeah. um, the internet, but it's thrown up a lot of new models um, that I think the likes of the film, games, maybe even fashion industry are learning from now. Yeah. But um, essentially, it, within the context of social media, um, what um, are, there, are there particular rights issues that people should be aware of in terms of their own work and like when you're creating work and uploading it to platforms and so on? Social media is essentially an extension of digital media which has been around uh, since the period I just referred to mm -hmm. there. So um, uh, it's, it's uh, worth remembering that uh, although social media feels quite new to us, um, the law which sits underneath it, in fact surrounds it, we're all subject to um, has been around for decades and that hasn't changed really. I mean there have been tweaks made to it here and there but uh, copyright law still exists as it was long before uh, we were all using the internet. Yeah. Um, and uh, like the rest of digital media, social media presents uh, challenges and opportunities for people who are involved in content creation. Um, the, the, the challenges are of course that um, there's a loss of control <coughs> Excuse me. Loss of control over how your your uh, your content, whether it's uh, video footage or recorded music or visual art, or uh, if you're a writer, your novel, your poetry, mm -hmm. that sort of thing, how that's distributed, um, and uh, so your work may uh, be distributed to people who aren't necessarily paying for access mm. to it. Um, but there's also opportunities that come with that, which uh, are mainly centre around the opportunity for you to, to develop an audience and grow an audience. Um, the challenge that flows from that is how you then monetize that. Um, but uh, I think there's, there is this duality, which there has always been from the beginning, uh, when digital media first uh, arrived, and social media is just a further extension of that, essentially. That's, that's how I see it. If you go back, like uh, I've been talking about this recently with people that um, obviously the online retail is big and there are a lot, you know, there are ways of selling physical and digital products online, but um, certainly with the music industry, um, retail of physical products has 
declined dramatically um, from what it was 10, 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. Um, when, when and, and of course, before the internet, before digital formats, if you wanted to own a piece of music, as it were, if you wanted to be able to play it anytime, you had to buy a piece of plastic. Yeah. Um, but um, before that, before people made and distributed physical products, the musicians still made money either through performing or uh, license, you know, composing, com uh, writing commissions, yes. or being uh, benefit from uh, patronage of the arts. Absolutely. And so yeah. on. so um, uh, with that, I don't, I don't want to be as contentious. Uh, certainly not in this format. I'll probably do this on my own terms on a blog, as to say um, that retail and the music industry was a momentary blip in its history. Um, but it is fair to say that before people sold products, there was lots of money um, derived from exploitation of the IP around music, and there's still those opportunities online. And in fact, perhaps they present a greater opportunity through the kind of audience development that you're talking about? Uh, well, mu there was music publishing before there was before there was music recording. Yeah. Um, um, although this sometimes can feel like ancient history, I, I, I taught copyright law at Glasgow University for years, and um, I, I always began by talking to students about this, because mm -hmm. actually there are direct parallels with where we are now, and although I'm, I don't, won't give you a history lesson, but essentially copyright law in the UK began at the instigation of entrepreneurs who invested heavily in printing presses. <clears throat> and um, that was that was because they had identified that uh, if they could um, duplicate good quality copies of uh, written word, um, then people would be willing to buy that from them. And in order to have the right to do that, they would do a deal with the the, the writer, the novelist, or the poet. Um, uh, but they would want it to be exclusive. So they wanted to know that if they printed copies, uh, that somebody else with access to a printing press couldn't then copy their copies. Mm -hmm. um, and the very first copyright law in the UK, well, it wasn't the UK at the time, um, but uh, uh, was was really instigated by by the, the 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 owners of these printing presses because they wanted to be able to see a return on their investment by uh, preventing others from competing with them by selling yeah. the same the same things. And uh, in, in some ways there are really quite remarkable parallels of where we are just now because um, we have seen over the last 10-15 years the advent of really uh, game-changing technology. We've seen the ability to make perfect copies. We've seen the, the ability to distribute that globally in an instant essentially. Um, and but the difference is that this time around that it's, it's very difficult to put uh, a fence around that like it was uh, in the days of the printing press because uh, you could print illegally a million copies of something but you still had to somehow find a way of getting it out there and that took time and resource and there was every likelihood you would be caught doing it. Now of course with digital media it's very difficult to to, uh, it's very difficult to combat that um, and there are ongoing debates around whether we should, when I say we I mean society, in whichever country you live, whether society should be trying to um, shore up copyright law as it is at the moment or whether we should actually be accepting that copyright law is no longer fit for purpose if that's the case and we should be looking at other ways of, um, of uh, fulfilling the original objectives of copyright law, which were essentially to incentivise investment by entrepreneurs and also incentivise creativity so that people felt that they uh, would have a reasonable prospect of being remunerated if they were to sit down and create something. Um, so, so we're looking for other ways in which that can be done. Mm. And the, the type of remuneration, um, whether that's buying a product yeah. or um, Paying for a performance or supporting the creator in whatever way—that's uh, that's the kind of where the new models are, or where new and old models are um, still evolving and adapting. Yeah, well, I mean, to link back to your your previous question, the what did change was that uh, 
for a long time the printers were selling sheet music and then with, with the advent of recording technology it was uh, quickly realised that although there was money to be made in allowing artists to come into your recording studio and make their own record for their own personal use, there was a lot more money to be made by uh, somehow getting those bits of plastic as they were or bits of shellac in the early days out into the marketplace. Um, uh, and what's, what was established at that point was this notion of uh, the consumer paying for access to a copy of the sound recording. Um, and that lasted really from the early part of the last century up until now and continues to exist. But there's a growing uh, drift away from that as, as we know, although, although um, income from recorded music is still very substantial globally, mm. it's nothing like what it was at its height, which was perhaps about 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and all the indicators are that that's likely to continue unless things significantly change, and I can talk about them in a minute. However, what we've also seen during that period is um, a shift in the income of the more established artists uh, who typically made as much money from touring as they did from sales of recordings and their own songs, the publishing of their songs. A greater proportion of their income now is attached to the live experience, whether through sales of tickets or uh, sponsorship deals with owners of big brands that want to be associated with the artist or through the sale of merchandise and a relatively small proportion of that, of their total income, is attributable to the sales of the recordings. But the recordings continue to have a very important role uh, in the ecosystem of their career mm. because it is uh, essentially the currency. Uh, it, it established them as being current within the marketplace. So that's why they continue to do it. And of course the income from them is not insignificant, it's just not what it was. Yeah, yeah. and, and um in looking at, well, it's, it's interesting to look at uh, different types of income stream through selling recordings or selling any kind of uh, product that's uh, created, whether that's um, a book or a film or, or um, you know, a, a, perhaps a collection of academic essays or, you know, uh, science papers or whatever it might be, you know, this is not limited to, to music Absolutely or the arts not. in any no, way. No, not at all. Uh, I, we're talking about creative exploitation of IP but creativity in all its forms. Yeah. If you, like, accepting that it's a good idea to get um, your name out there and a good way of doing that is to, in the case of music, using recordings, but it could be um, essays or, or whatever. Um, how important is IP there, in even if you're not um, directly trying to draw revenue, but you want, you need the credit where it's due, you know, attribution. Yeah, I mean, there's when 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 content is distributed online by the by the the owner of that, um, they're generally doing it for one of several reasons. Um, fundamentally, most creative people I've ever dealt with want their work to be uh, seen or heard or experienced. That's their number one objective. Um, uh, and for most of them, that, that's, that's far and away and more important than being paid for it. Being mm -hmm. paid is very important because it allows them to continue to do that, but really mm -hmm. what they're looking to do is to make that connection and, and for people to you know, experience it and to appreciate it. Social media allows that, uh, allows creators of whatever kind to do that um, on a scale and with a speed and a quality. Um, that was unimaginable uh, even even five or ten years ago. Um, the, 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 the growth in uh, large media content companies um, uh, came about because they were seen as being essentially the, the gatekeepers. Um, they, had, they, they could give uh, creators access to market. Mm -hmm. um, and that worked well, of course, for many people, but it also disenfranchised a lot of creators who simply didn't have, you know, weren't, weren't fortunate enough, I suppose, to be able to, to do a deal with um, the larger uh, media content companies. Um, so they were, left, uh, they were left 
essentially trying to do things for themselves, which was very, very difficult um, in the days when the only op the only way that you could you could get profile would be through perhaps um, radio or television or some other uh, large scale platform, um, which were very difficult to access for most people without the clout of um, uh, corporate support behind them. What social media has done uh, is it's provided a great leveller. Uh, so anybody actually, um, whether they're making film or music um, or writing, uh, can, can get their work out there. Um, so it's, it's been a positive step from that point of view. But what they will find quite quickly is that the, because there are so many other people doing the same thing, mm -hmm. that in a sense, although um, it uh, has, has had a democratising effect, and uh, empowering effect, that they then have the secondary challenge of, of um, getting their name known so that people will then start to, to choose their work over somebody else's. But there are ways in which that can be done and we're seeing, we're seeing platforms that are allowing that to be done already and of course it all comes down to a lot of the time the quality of the work mm -hmm. and the nature of your approach to promoting it, if you like. When when people are promoting that work and trying to get it out in as many places as possible, um, is it important to to be mindful of some kind of licensing, um, whether even Creative Commons licenses and so on? I think um, when you are putting your work out there, you need to be clear about why you're doing it and what your objectives are. And if your objective is purely to raise awareness. Um, at that point in the hope that you will then be approached by a media company, mm -hmm. it might be a record company, it could be a TV company, an animation company, whatever, uh, a publishing company. If your hope is that you will start to develop, uh, build an audience and that will then attract the attention of um, uh, a business, a corporation who can uh, uh, then support you in your endeavour, then uh, you probably don't need to think about it in too legalistic a, a, a way because your primary objective is just to get your name known. Um, for many people though, the vast majority of people who, who, who make their content available online, promote it through social media, um, th that will never happen. It's just a numbers thing. There simply mm -hmm. isn't, there aren't the resources. It's just impossible for everybody to, be, to receive corporate support from the kind of companies I used to work for, it's never going to happen. Um, so uh, I think it's important for them to, uh, to devise a strategy which will allow them to both promote their work, their name, uh, but also um, uh, is they are, they are, they are uh, if you like, attracting people to a place where those people can then pay mm -hmm. something which will remunerate them for their endeavours. Now I'm talking in real generalities here because I don't want to be too prescriptive about it. Um, but for example, um, if you are uh, somebody who uh, is making music, I'll use that as an example because it's one that's familiar to me, but also in some ways music has continually been at the forefront mm. of, of this. It's a little bit like the canary in the, in the, the coal mine. Um, it's, it's actually experienced a lot of other challenges and has in some ways overcome them and in some ways succumbed to them. But if you're somebody who wants to make recordings and you want to have a live career, uh, for example, then uh, it makes sense absolutely to, to have a website um, where people can go and experience what your music is about. It, it makes absolute sense for you to use social media to uh, to lead people to that. I'm not keen on the phrase drive traffic because I don't think that's really the right, the right mindset for people mm. to adopt, but you know, it's certainly a way of... of um, to like attract an audience. Attract, yeah. attract an audience. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that once they get there, you want to provide them with opportunities to, um, uh, to, to part with payment mm. for something. And the, the, the tricky bit, but it's not rocket science, is to figure out what it is that you have that they might be willing to pay for. No, it might not be. It might be that they're not willing to pay for um, a copy of your single or your album, but they might be willing to pay for a t-shirt because a t-shirt can't be replicated. I mean, they could mm -hmm. go down to a local t-shirt shop, but that would be, I think, probably a low point of cool if they were to do that. 
Um, more effort than it's more worth. More effort than it's worth, yeah. really. So I think, um, you know, if, if you're selling a T-shirt for 15 or 20 pounds uh, and your margin, you're, you're making a nice profit for each of them, does it really matter that you're not being paid for the record? Mm. I know that for some people it does, uh, and I can understand that. Um, but is that based on a principle of the way it used to be? It's a based on a principle yeah. of the way it used to be. And actually, uh, I, I've encouraged artists over the years of various kinds to, uh, to think of themselves as a business. Mm. And if your business is about being creative, then um, does it really matter why people are paying you as long as they're paying you? Because what they're buying into by buying a t-shirt is a sense of you. They're buying into what yeah. you are. You um, could do free performances via live stream online every night and sell mugs, branded mugs. You can do all of that. If, you, if you've got an audience, uh, if, you have a, if you build a, a significant enough audience, mm. when I say significant, it doesn't, I'm not talking only in terms of actual numbers, I'm talking about what marketers would, would regard as interesting groups of people who they can then sell things to. Yeah. You can then start to monetize that audience by just using straightforward uh, advertising. Mm -hmm. um, which is tailored to your audience. Um, you can play live shows, which people will pay to come to, although they might have doubt, they might have not have wanted to pay for the record. Because they've listened to the record and want to see you play live, they will come and they will come and pay to play live because that can't be replicated. If they want the communal experience of seeing you playing live, there's only one way to do that, and that mm -hmm. is by paying the ticket price. So, and that's I suppose where the intellectual property of the creativity of the artist, be it in this case a band or any kind of artist really, is that's something that you can always hold on to because if people are supporting you by buying a t-shirt or um, coming to a performance or something ra rather than directly buying a copy of that recording of a yeah. performance of your work, um, then that can it's much harder to infringe on that, isn't it? Well, it can't be replicated um, at home. You know, you, you, mm. somebody who's been to see a band playing live, talking to their friends about how good it was, simply isn't able to snap their fingers and, yeah. and replicate that for them. The person has, their friends have to wait until the band come around again. Yeah. And what's interesting is, if you link back to what I said earlier about um, uh, the, the underlying public policy for copyright, which was to mm -hmm. incentivize entrepreneurs and creators. Um, what we're, what, we're, what we're seeing now is that um, although copyright is being seriously eroded by digital media, and that's not, I'm, not, I'm not making any judgment on that, it's just a matter of fact, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, creative people of different sorts continue to, to, to be remunerated. They certainly continue to make work. Yeah. And entrepreneurs continue to invest in, in creative work. Um, and uh, often, the, the, the income that's derived from that is attributable to things which are not necessarily copyright protected. Um, a live uh, concert is of itself not copyright protected. So mm. um, it's quite interesting that the, it's almost like the, the copyright law is out of step with what, where people's where audiences are at now, yeah, um, and uh, people seem willing to continue to pay for concerts, even if they aren't or they're less inclined to pay for um, the recordings, whether it's a digital download or or, or, a, or a physical or a physical product. Flipping it slightly from people creating their own work or ex or sort of mainly or exclusively creating work to uh, people who edit or curate work a bit more because uh, that happens a lot through social media as well and yeah. you know we've, we've both been involved in that and recommending uh, great articles videos and so on yes. because we think they're valuable useful want to share them and um, that is possible also to to make money through doing that because you can build say you you go talk at events or you um, consult for businesses or um, you know edit any kind of um, service that you can provide that can be monetized in those ways 
and you can build a reputation. There's something that we talk about in seminars quite a lot about building the voice of authority. Yes. You don't need to necessarily create your no. own content. You can curate it from the massive resource that's available, and especially in social media platforms. But are there any IP issues to be aware of then when you're using other people's work that they've published for and with the express uh, intention of getting you know lots of views of videos they want people to see this stuff yes um, but there, is there anything to be cautious of there well the uh, if work is protected by copyright it's protected by copyright yeah. so that that always applies there are there are exceptions to copyright protection um, which are um, very specific and so for example um, the news media can legitimately use uh, photographs provided they're legally obtained. Mm -hmm. They can use um, uh, they can use excerpts from 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 other uh, uh, written works that's copyright protected if it is relevant to the news. Um, uh, similarly, students and people with invo involved in education can use copyright protected works if it's for education purposes. Um, uh, and you can you can also use them if they're uh, if it's for uh, critical uh, you know for criticism for legitimate criticism. So those are, those all apply anyway, and they applied long before uh, social media became a reality. So uh, nothing has changed there. Um, it hasn't really been tested yet. That there there are um, what you're touching upon are essentially uh, I suppose. Two kinds of two, two phenomena that have arisen over the last couple of years. One is the the, the sort of super blogger, the Uber blogger, mm -hmm. um, uh, who uh, has a blog site which essentially gathers stories from places and then adds his or her uh, spin on it. And uh, of course, traffic goes to that person's uh, site. They're leading traffic to it um, through through using. Facebook or Google Plus or, or LinkedIn or Twitter or wh whatever it is they're doing. Um, uh, but on their site there are then uh, commercial opportunities, they're perhaps selling uh, advertising through Google Ads, they might have merchandise, um, that kind of thing. Um, there's also uh, the, the, the larger version of that which is the aggregator and mm -hmm. probably the most preeminent of that would be something like um, the Huffington Post. Yeah. Um, Huffington is a combination of original content which they commission from writers who in the main don't get paid for it or get mm. paid very little but benefit in their minds I think from the association with Huffington Post and some of them want aspire to be the sort of super bloggers I just mentioned mm -hmm. um, and some of the content is simply uh, hyperlinks to the home site of a, of a mainstream media company. Uh, like the BBC or, or you know, a, a major newspaper and that sort of thing. Um, there's a, this is a fairly great area because um, uh, in the main, uh, content that's on websites is still uh, largely free. Um, there have been, of course, uh, examples of websites which have uh, introduced paywalls. Mm -hmm. um, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the London Times, have all done that. The, the Guardian is now looking at, at some way of monetizing its content. It's a fantastic resource, the Guardian, uh, Guardian uh, website, but it's it's unsustainable. We know mm -hmm. that they've said that. Um, so it, it's going to be. I think we're going through a shift where previously content that was on websites, and I'm not talking here about iTunes, which is clearly a distribution platform, a commercial distribution platform. I just mean straightforward publishing sites. Um, the content was there. Uh, and was intent. The, the objective was to try as many eyeballs to that, um, to build audience, uh, either so that you could then sell advertising off the back of it, or so that you could engage with them in some other way, which you could then monetize. Um, uh, there's been a growing realization that often, the the money doesn't come. Um, uh, if you can get advertising uh, in sufficient numbers, there is revenue. There is revenue there, but one of the problems is that with the proliferation of of, of sites with content on them, um, there are uh, a finite number of users online, of course, mm. and there are more more sites for them to look at. So it's a little bit like there's a direct analogy here with um, uh, television, 
where when I was growing up, I remember there only being three channels in the UK, and then Channel 4 arrived, and then Channel 5 arrived, and uh, now there are, uh, I think, on satellite channels, there's a couple of hundred channels. Um, uh, but the, the, the number of people who are watching television hasn't increased by 20 times mm. within that period. Mm. So the audience is spread more thinly across the across the channels and so it is with um, these uh, with with, the, with content websites so that's a long way of saying that essentially they they are having to find ways of um, monetizing their content and I think we're going to see a shift away from them feeling comfortable with uh, aggregators simply curating and then republishing their content um, uh, when those they're making money out of it, if yeah. they're not receiving a, a piece yeah. of it, you know. And, and I think that is that's very valid actually, because whilst it's uh, if you're cr a creating work and you want to build an audience, then you know if I'm a short film uh, producer and Wired picks up the film as an example of a great uh, use of new technology, yeah. and then, uh, the views will spike dramatically one would expect and um, and hopefully that will benefit my career um, my prospects oh, featured in Wired, that's good but Wired is selling ads off the back of that, the viewing who absolutely you know, seen that video and I'm not getting anything back from it, I was thinking there that there are, there is still there's potential to make that work both ways through ad partnerships or branded content product placements and so on sure, but sure. that maybe requires a bit more of a joined up approach to how this content is used and shared and yeah. so on I think um, I think we're already seeing some of that uh, at the higher levels uh, so you have um, if, you're, if you're an established creator in some in whatever way if mm. you're if you're if you're a major novelist or, or you're a you're a major uh, recording artist or a visual artist um, or a filmmaker uh, you are in a much stronger position um, than somebody who's just starting out so uh, there are ways in which you can be creative about how your content is exploited um, uh, so that you can then negotiate terms with uh, aggregators essentially are publishing platforms which which allow them to benefit from audience which they then uh, uh, can sell advertising to but you get something out of it as well because you get the scale of their platform mm -hmm. they get the richness of your content yeah the trouble is that um, uh, it's only the more established uh, uh, creative uh, Creative people who can who can actually who can actually do that, and for the people who are at the beginning of their career or who, who are perhaps uh, haven't reached that level of um, uh, success or, or, or uh, uh, reputation, it's really hard to assert their, themselves in that way. And this isn't although this this feels like a modern or a, or a, or a new issue. It's been around actually for a very long time. Um, uh, uh, Many really since the advent of rock and roll, promoters have been saying to bands, "If you turn up and play, I can't pay you, but it'll give you promotion." Um, and actors have been appearing in plays and films and mm -hmm. television, you know, productions for little or no money uh, on the promise of something coming out of it. So, um, the golden rule I always think is to be clear about why you are doing something. Um, and social media doesn't change that; it's just another. It's just another outlet for yeah, your, your work. Yeah. Be clear about why you're doing something because um, there will always be people who will say to you that you will benefit in some way from it. And you, it really, it, it's, it's, um, it's a choice. It's about questioning whether that is likely to happen mm -hmm. um, because uh, the, essentially you are the piece of content for that day and tomorrow they'll move on to something else and yeah. the day after. So uh, in the same way that newspapers are always looking for, for stories and you know, they'll try and persuade you to give them their story, your story. Um, so I, I think that uh, people who are involved in cre creativity, um, uh, when they are looking at the opportunities here, I think that they, uh, just for their own sake, would do well to consider really, realistically, what, what's the upside here for me and what's the potential downside? To it. Should I um, uh, 
am I better saying no to this and actually doing something else entirely, which might be more creative and might enhance my prospects more? I think we're going to wrap up in a moment, but just before we do, um, where do you think it's going in terms of before we started the show, we were talking a little bit about uh, the change in models of content distribution and the fact that um, with big uh, commercial operators like Apple and Amazon having such a, a strong position in the in distribution monetization of content and the fact that mobile devices are overtaking computers and sure. people are accessing much more through mobile handsets and tablets and so on. So then that changes um, the potential for exploiting IP and for selling directly to consumers? I, I think that the the bigger players, the bigger uh, media companies are uh, mostly made up of what were once small businesses and then mm -hmm. they merged uh, over, over decades um, uh, and as they've got bigger uh, they've tended to focus on projects which they are confident or are reasonably confident will give them a return of the, at the level that they require. Uh, what that means is that there are many, many creative people who are simply uh, um, uh, left out of that altogether and I think that uh, the convergence of digital media and mobile technology um, is going to is already presenting opportunities for um, individual creators working themselves or in collaboration with others to create work and to put it out there. They're going to have to find ever ever uh, uh, more ingenious ways of, of promoting themselves and marketing themselves. But what I do think will come into the uh, the marketplace over time are um, platforms which are open to all and which shall allow the consumer to to buy almost directly. So a little bit like the digital equivalent of a farmer's market. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there is a renewed interest among many people in the provenance of what they are consuming online and I think that's, I, my sense is that that's going to continue. And that isn't in competition with, if you like, the more, if we're using this analogy of the farmer's market, people still want to go to uh, major retailers, major supermarkets for their weekly shopping, but they also like the experience of going to a farmer's market where they can buy yeah. directly. So the two coexist nicely and I think that we're going to see more of that um, happening uh, over over the next five to ten years. And I think that as micropayments start to become more uh, widely accepted, mm -hmm. um, we will see uh, the creators benefiting directly um, without the need for an intermediary um, like a record company or a film distributor. Um, they might, they might uh, graduate to that if they build an audience of a scale that is of interest to these larger corporations, but um, uh, if they don't, that's okay because they can continue to make a living. So it's almost like craft principles applied yeah. to digital content. Excellent. Well, I look forward to exploring that, seeing how it goes. But thank you very much, Murray. That's been brilliant.